great to see everyone buzzing and talking after that terrific first panel, but it's time for our second panel, uh, which is entitled Reconstruction, America's Second Founding and Public Memory. And we have three terrific and distinguished panelists who are going to lead this discussion uh, with us, and I'd like to introduce them to you as they come out. Eric Foner is the DeWitt Clinton Professor of History at Columbia University. He specializes in the study of Civil War and Reconstruction, Slavery, and 19th Century America. Uh, his seminal work, I'm now reading off the script, Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution, 1863 to 1877, is my second Bible on the Reconstruction period after W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, Black Reconstruction. These two books, if you want to understand this, this period, in fact, if you are an American and a scholar of American history, you should own these two books, W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Thank Reconstruction you. and Eric Foner's Reconstruction, America's Unfinished Revolution. Um, he's a, a one of only two persons to serve as president of the Organization of American Historians, American Historical Association, and Society of American Historians. He's been uh, the curator, curator of several museum exhibits, including the prize-winning A House Divided, America in the Age of Lincoln at the uh, Chicago Historical Society. His book, The Fiery Trial, Abraham Lincoln and American Slavery, won the Pulitzer, Bancroft, and Lincoln Prizes for 2011. And his latest book is Gateway to Freedom, The Hidden History of the Underground Railroad. Kate Massor is an historian of the United States examining intersections of law, politics, and everyday life. Her scholarship explores how Americans grappled with questions of race and equality after the abolition of slavery in both the North and the South. Massour is author of An Example for All the Land, Emancipation and the Struggle Over Equality in Washington, D.C., and numerous articles on emancipation and black politics during and after the Civil War. With Gregory P. Down, she recently co-edited really a wonderful uh, collection of essays, The World the Civil War Made, which I highly recommend to you, uh, that charts new directions in the study of the post-Civil War era. She's also worked with the National Park Service on several projects related to the era of Reconstruction. In 2014-15, she was an Andrews Fellow at the Hunt Hutchins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University. And finally, last but not least, the Volia Glimpf is a professor of history and African and African American studies at Duke University. Her research and teaching focuses on slavery, the U.S. South, emancipation, reconstruction, and African American women's history. She's the author of a wonderful volume, Out of the House of Bondage, The Transformation of the Plantation Household, uh, published in 2008 and is a co-editor of two volumes of Freedom, a documentary history of emancipation, 1861 to 1867, a part of the Freedmen and Southern Society Project. Her forthcoming works in, include Women at War, Black Women and Children Refugees, A History of War and Refugee Camps in the United States, which is a study of the experience of enslaved and freed women and children refugees on the battlefields of the Civil War, and a study of Civil War veterans who served in the Egyptian army in the 1870s entitled Playing Dixie in Egypt. Uh, as I, I'm sure you can hear, this is an extraordinary panel for this dis discussion. Please join me in welcoming them. So I have to tell you that I am um, fascinated and really riveted by the period that we call Reconstruction, and I could not imagine three better people to have this conversation with. And so I have my own curiosities, and so you're basically just listening in on my conversation <laughs> with these three individuals. Um, I really want to begin with the term Reconstruction, because people use that word, and I'm not clear that everybody knows exactly what it means, what time period we're talking about, how we really uh, border Reconstruction in its beginning and its end, um, and how we separate it from other periods uh, during that time. And I think I want to be begin on the far end with, with Kate, because uh, Kate has suggested that maybe the very term Reconstruction is one that we should uh, retire. Uh, and that maybe we should more be talking about the post-war period. And so I just thought you, since that's so provocative, um, because so many of us are so connected to this term reconstruction, if you could kind of describe why you, why you uh, posit that, that theory and what you mean when you talk about this period, and then we'll take it to the Volia and to Eric. Sure, um, thank you. I, um, so in the uh, volume that I co-edited with Greg Downs called The World the Civil War Made, in our introduction to the volume, we talked about how the complexities of the use of the term reconstruction. And first of all, the chronological parameters of reconstruction, let's say, for example, in Eric Foner's fabulous 
work of synthesis and, and pioneering scholarship defines the period from 1863, the uh, issuing kind of the issuing of the Emancipation Proclamation to 1877, which was the compromise over the election of 1876. Um, that's a, a, a more or less traditional, well, especially now that uh, several years since the publication of uh, Eric's book, uh, that's how people often talk about it. Sometimes they start with 1865 to 1877. Um, but, and so this is a period after the Civil War. Um, it is a period of tremendously uh, creative policy making, as we talked about in the first panel. And so sometimes when people talk about Reconstruction, what they mean is the policies that were made primarily in Congress to reconstruct the nation, to bring the former Confederate states back into the nation, to make a new nation. So that's a kind of version of what is Reconstruction. Uh, another kind of broader way of using the term is it's a period in American history. It's a period in which a huge number of things were going on simultaneously, and it's not just about policymaking from Washington, it's about uh, grassroots politics, it's about kind of every kind of debate about what kind of a country will uh, exist post-Civil War. Um, more recently, people have, some scholars and, and other people have talked about other versions of Reconstruction. Reconstructing the North, what did that look like? Reconstruction of the West, the idea of a greater Reconstruction that ran from the end of the Mexican-American War into some time in the post-Civil War period. And so there's this kind of proliferation of ways of talking about Reconstruction. And so one of the ideas that we were playing with there was, in order to really define what we're talking about, what would it be like to bracket the term Reconstruction and just try to talk about precisely what we're talking about? Some people may be writing about policy. Some people may be writing about um, the meanings of freedoms for African Americans. Some people may be writing about in, uh, Indian wars in the West. Um, and instead of constantly reconstructing this or reconstructing that, maybe it would be useful to kind of go back to basics. So I just want to say I'm not uh, polemical on this issue, and I'm sure we'll use that term a lot in this panel and that's completely fine with me. Um, but I think it's an interesting thought experiment and a way of just trying to clarify what we're talking about in general here. Well, well it is, and the reason I wanted to begin with that question is because Zavolia, to reconstruct something implies that you are constructing something that was already constructed before and then destroyed. But the truth is, an America in which black people were actually citizens and so forth actually had not existed before. And so we weren't actually reconstructing anything. We were constructing something new and, fre and fresh, potentially. Uh, and that may be part of the challenge. But how do you define the term? I, I think you're exactly right that part of the challenge is uh, that we are really building something new. Um, and reconstruction does imply that we're rebuilding something, and maybe we're doing both at the same time. And mm -hmm. I think uh, to talk about the chronology, it's really important, I think, to think about Reconstruction as beginning when the war began. Because at that moment, Americans had to start thinking about, OK, what, what will come after the war? Um, at that moment, they had to start thinking about um, what would happen with the uh, slaves, because at that moment, um, black people began running away um, from slavery. At that moment, the nation had to figure out what was the relationship between the northern states of the United States of America and the southern states. Um, so when Lincoln goes before you know the, the country and he gives his first inaugural address, he's really trying to parse this moment of what it will mean, what war means, and what Reconstruction will look like. And he doesn't do a very good job as far as black people are concerned, but um, he, he is trying to, to deal with the bigger question. And so I think Reconstruction begins on De in December of 1860, yeah. when South Carolina is seized from the nation. Wow. I'm not sure when it ends, um, but I'm perfectly happy um, bringing Reconstruction to an end um, with the Plessy decision. I mean, I think it, it, it sort of um, very clearly says, you know, we're done with you people, that is, former slaves. Um, we're moving on, and, you know, I, I think it's really important to think about what that declaration, we're done with you, really meant and how long it had been festering and the ways in which it had been festering. I think the first panel dealt with that to some extent. Terrific. So Eric, you, you wrote the book? Yes. You put the, you put the dates out there? <laughs> well, uh, I have a vested interest yeah. in keeping the word reconstruction <laughs> because that's the title of my book. So I don't want Kate changing the, the nomenclature here. 
But um, yeah, the fact, I mean, actually, I think the way to think about Reconstruction is as not as necessarily a specific time period, but as a kind of historical mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. The process by which the United States, everybody in the United States, had to try to come to terms with the consequences of the Civil War, the two most important of which were the preservation of the nation and the destruction of the institution of slavery. What are the consequences of those things for Americans, north, south, east, west, et cetera? In that sense, Reconstruction is still going on. It, we're still trying to come to terms with the consequences of the end of slavery uh, uh, in this country. Um, but I would just add that this was debated during Reconstruction because demo, with, whether you called it Reconstruction or Restoration, was a political question. Mm -hmm. Democrats tended to talk about restoration. Yes, th there's a war, we're gonna keep the nation together, but then we're just going back to, mm -hmm. uh, their phrase was the, you know, the, the union as it was, the constitution as it is. They didn't, mm -hmm. reconstruction implied radical change mm -hmm. uh, in the constitution, as we heard, and in many other aspects of life. Um, and there were many who didn't want that to happen. So. Um, uh, Reconstruction had a more, I think, had a more radical implication, at least in the earlier years, than than one might one might think. But you know, the date it ends well. If we could go, pay, you know, historians don't know how to count really. <laughs> well, uh, no. We think of you know, there's a long 19th century yeah. which goes from the French Revolution <laughs> to the you know, it's just it's <laughs> not more than 100 years. But um, if we're going to use a Supreme Court decision, I, we might even go further. Mm -hmm into maybe Giles v. Harris, mm -hmm. which is the early 20th century, where the Supreme Court just threw up its hands and said, look, if the people of Alabama, the white people, want to disenfranchise all the blacks, oh, we can't do anything about that. Tough it may luck. be unconstitutional, but we can't change we, it. We so. can't do anything, so forget <laughs> yeah. it. Don't, don't bother us anymore. Mm -hmm. You could say that's the end of Reconstruction as a political mm -hmm. process, where the, you know, the elimination of the black vote in the South ends the political opening that Reconstruction had created uh, years before. Well, I tend to think of it as the civil rights cases, you know. And, That's another and it, one, Was that yeah. 1885 or 83, 83, 83, right, in which the Supreme Court essentially says, you know, how long must we, you know, treat the newly freed slave as a specially favored class, you know, uh, expressing mm -hmm. what, what my colleague Darren Hutchinson called racial exhaustion. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who, you know, have that expression today, right, who say, how long, you know, about affirmative action, they should know that the Supreme Court was saying that, you know, 20 years after slavery ended, they were saying, oh my God, haven't we done enough? Um, and so I kind of think of that as the date. Mm -hmm. But you know, something interesting in your, in, your, in your book, Eric, and maybe we can talk a little bit about what the features of Reconstruction, what, what was this period like? What was happening, particularly politically, uh, in the South for, uh, for blacks and for whites? The part that I think is interesting is that you, just, you use this term presidential Reconstruction. Um, remember, this is post, after the assassination of President Lincoln, Andrew Johnson, uh, is the president, and he's a very particular person, um, and you can maybe describe him a little bit. And his, he makes some choices, um, some very timid choices. We heard in the previous panel Daryl Miller talk about you know, the fact that there is actually a narrative and a, and a history of what conquest looks like, but it's clear that this is not in the card, certainly for President Andrew Johnson. And so some of the choices he makes about political leadership in the South in this period May, may in some ways have laid the foundation for the dooming of Reconstruction as being as transformative as it, transformative as it could have been. And I wonder if you could begin by well, talking about that. Well, you know, uh, uh, how should I put this? Uh, sometimes we find ourselves as Americans stuck with a president who is just totally unfit for the office. <laughs> and, um, you know, that was Andrew Johnson. Uh, Johnson has a good claim Johnson has a claim to being the worst president in American history. There are contenders for that, but <laughs> Johnson, Johnson has a claim. Uh, you know, one could go into a long thing, but the basic point he suggests, he was deeply racist, he had no ability to work with Congress, he had no sense of Northern public sentiment, and he, presidential reconstruction, he set up new governments in the South, mm -hmm. all white, you know, with black people having no, basically no civil rights at all, or, and no political rights whatsoever. And, um, you know, they went on and did things we heard about in the previous panel, these black codes and other forms of, uh, you know, of subordination of, of the black population. But I think one then has to go beyond that. I mean, if you mentioned Du Bois, I think the, if you want, I think the, the most important way to think about Reconstruction, to my mind, is the way Du Bois described it. It was a moment in the history of democracy in this country. 
and in fact in the whole world. It was a remarkable effort to create an interracial democracy mm -hmm. in a society less than 10 years yeah. past slavery. And um, you know, it didn't work in some ways, it did work in other ways, but the very fact that this happened and that you, African Americans began exercising genuine political power uh, was a remarkable thing in the 19th century in the aftermath of slavery and generated a violent reaction. We heard about the Colfax massacre mm -hmm. in the pre previous panel and many, many such uh, incidents in the South. So, you know, politically, Reconstruction was a radical change in the nature of what had been a slave society, mm -hmm. you know, until just a few years before Reconstruction was implemented. Mm -hmm. Do either of you want to comment on that, on, these, on, the, on, on the kind of promise of Reconstruction and the thwarting of it? I mean, one was that the absence of presidential leadership, right, mm -hmm. to make the right kinds of decisions, but there were other reasons or other contributing causes to, um, you know, this, this moment of democracy being a moment rather, rather than the kind of extended period that it, it could have been, that could have been truly, truly transformational. And that moment was fairly easily undone. Uh, because of multiple reasons, not just President Johnson. So, Savoli, why don't we start with you and then go to Kate? Okay, so I, you know, I want to go back to your comment about this racial exhaustion um, problem. I think Reconstruction was undone in part because we had a president who was not uh, willing to do um, what was necessary, but I also think it was undone because we tend to think of Reconstruction ending um, after the withdrawal of troops um, in 1870, or the compromise in 1876 leading to the withdrawal of troops, and, and that the, this moment signifies the racial exhaustion, but I think it goes back further. I mean, I think if you look at um, the very moment that black people were emancipated, um, well, the moments uh, going back to the Civil War, going back to the Emancipation Proclamation, going back to congressional measures like the Confiscation Acts of 1862. At each of those moments, there was resistance from white Americans, North and South. And so that resistance in some ways solidified, and I think by the time we get to Reconstruction, there is massive, still massive white resistance. We see it in the race riots in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, um, we see it in the um, um, sort of repellent actions on the part of um, um, military officials during the war. We see it after the war. We see it as African Americans are now free people trying to grab hold of, claim citizenship and, and, and give some meaning to freedom. We see them being constantly pushed back. But what's also very important to me is that we see them keep pushing forward. And that's what Du Bois was talking about, this, this constant um, effort on the part of black people to keep that movement going forward in spite of um, the violence in, vi in spite of Colfax and, and many more Colfaxes. Um, and I think one of the arguments I've been trying to make for years, uh, and since I'm putting it grammatically in that way, that means I didn't succeed, um, <laughs> is that you know, when we talk about monuments and memory, we are always framing black people uh, sort of responding to these monuments. And, and so my argument has been and remains that the monuments are a response to back black people's efforts to claim their freedom and citizenship. Mm -hmm. It's a response to their coming out by the thousands. You know, you'd find, um, Emancipation Day celebrations where there'd be 10,000 people, 5,000 people, people would come from miles, they'd walk from miles to these celebrations, not just to have a party, but to hear people talk about what it means to be free, to hear how their emancipation compared to the emancipation in other places in the world, in Haiti, for example, to hear how freedom looked here in comparison to Prussia even. And, and, and to hear people say to black women who were constantly being attacked and sexually assaulted, fight back. And we know that if you fight back, you might end up dead, but fight back. Uh, so there, there's that sort of, um, to use the very uh, portraits of words, that sort of discourse that black people are putting out there and white people are responding by no, we're gonna keep pushing back, pushing back and they do, and ultimately we got these uh, segregation laws in the 1890s and um, um, 
the disfranchisement laws um, beginning with Mississippi in 1890. Mm -hmm. okay. um, <clears throat> well, I, I guess one way that I have come to want to talk about this sort of notion of northern exhaustion or one of the narratives is that northerners just got tired of these issues and they turned their attention to other matters and there was you know the problem of greenbacks and there was the industrial revolution and um, this sort of it, it ends up feeling like what happened was the Republican Party in particular just kind of casually shifted gears. And one of the points that I want to emphasize, um, and this is something that we ended up writing about also in the National Park uh, Service study, the white Southerners made Northerners tired, if you will. One of the things that was happening was the perpetual white resistance to Reconstruction policy um, to, to um, sort of overtly violating federal law to not caring about federal authority, to actually shooting federal officials um, or harassing them, running them out of town. Um, they created, white Southerners created a series of kind of constitutional crises about how far under the uh, 14th Amendment and the Civil Rights Acts, not just of 1866, but of 1870 and 71, how far could the federal government go, particularly using the army, to continue to put down what were essentially white Southern insurrections against federal power. And that, we can talk about the you know, inadequacies in some respects of Congress's and uh, President Grant at that point's responses, but the, but the kind of continuing assault on federal policy was, uh, you know, it created major dilemmas for these federal officials. If you had had, you know, uh, white Southerners saying, you know, okay, we get it, we understand this needs to be the policy now, we might not like it, but we're, we're going to comply with it, there wouldn't have been so much exhaustion in the North, right? There would have been more um, kind of ability to continue to enforce these policies. So I just want to also restore some agency to um, white Southerners in this for helping to create that backing off of Reconstruction so, policy. I want to come to you, but, in the, but just because you say that, Kate, and I think it's so important, I want to actually return to what happens in the immediate aftermath of the war, war. Because Eric says in his book that essentially right after the war, the expectation of white Southerners was it's a wrap, right? That we lost and, and here it comes, right? They were, they were braced and would have, at least you I think, I hope I'm not, <laughs> I hope I'm saying it correctly, but you said, uh, implied that they would have acquiesced in large measure, not, not entirely, had the, the federal government come with the kind of strong, uncompromising positions that they expected would come. And that in fact, the timidity of the federal government allowed the Southerners to think that there was room for this kind of um, a pushback that you're describing and actually open the door. So I think you're absolutely uh, spot on to, po to point out that agency, but I want to return to this. Am I saying correctly no, what no, your thesis correct. is? Yeah, I mean, and, and this goes back to Andrew Johnson. Yeah. You, the, basically, Andrew Johnson told the White South, you don't really have to worry about all this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, yes, the slaves are free. You're not going to have slavery anymore, but other than that, you can do pretty much whatever you want. And instead of, yes, many white Southerners expected what they would have considered harsher or stronger measures from the federal government. This is all in 1865. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that story is Johnson's intransigence and the violence in the white South is in some way the creative dynamic that is pushing Congress further, mm -hmm. Northern Republicans. You wouldn't have had a 14th Amendment mm -hmm. in exactly the form it did without Johnson's intransigence and mm -hmm. the violence in the South. You wouldn't have had a 15th Amendment uh, later on. You wouldn't have had radical mm -hmm. reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So the very, so it's pushing Congress the in very way. conflict mm -hmm. is pushing people in a more radical direction until eventually they don't go any further in a radical direction for some of the reasons Kate was, uh, was suggesting. Uh, the main point, I guess, really, I mean, you're absolutely right, is that this is a dynamic period. It's a period in which people's outlooks are changing all the time. Um, people who in 1865 said, no, nah, I can't imagine we could give black men the right to vote, two years later were voting to give black men the right to vote. People who said, well, you know, we can't really deal with private discrimination. Then they go and vote a few years later for a bill banning discrimination by hotels and railroads and things like that. So. Um, you can't freeze this process at any moment, and you can't freeze 
people's idea that one of the problems with trying to figure out, let's say, well, what was the intent at that time? Well, the intent keeps changing mm -hmm. all through the period as events, uh, you know, take unexpected courses. So um, you have to look at the period whole. You can't say 1865, 1867, 1873. Mm -hmm. It's a long, complicated, dynamic process. Mm -hmm. Savoli, I want to go back to this issue of what, of what African Americans are doing in this period, um, because this is also, just to me, a very, very uh, powerful story, because African Americans are living in these communities with the kind of violent pushback that you're talking about. They're still showing up to vote. They're still trying to be postmasters. They're still uh, being secretary of states. They're, they're still trying to be magistrates. They're still being the police force. They're still, they're still pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing to have this full citizenship despite this, uh, the, the threat of, 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 where, of how they're living. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, about that political push. I also want to talk about the economic piece and what's happening during this period, right? Yeah, so now yeah. we're in this post-war period. What, what happens to, to black people in terms of their economic possibilities? Um, you know, what, what, what happens to the 40 acres and a mule? What's the, you know, what's the situation in terms of land? And given what we know about the black codes, which I think um, Daryl Miller described as, you know, supporting a kind of cartel uh, for black exploitation, which I think is a perfect way to describe it, um, how are black people managing their way through this kind of uh, economic stronghold that really is in every form seeking to return them to, to, to slavery in some form or another? So I'll start with you. Okay, so I mean, I, I really uh, appreciate your getting to the economic question. I want to start there because when we consider that when the war ended, um, the South was broke, right? <laughs> um, emancipation had liquidated um, the bulk of its wealth by emancipating enslaved people. Um, so the war ends. Um, it's April 1865. It's the time of the year when normally you would be beginning to plant your cotton crop. Um, and who's going to plant it? How are you going to convince former slaves to go back into the fields and at what cost? Um, can you pay them? So it's not only that you have four million ex-slaves, you have hundreds of thousands of ex-masters, right? who may still now have land if it hasn't been confiscated and Johnson will soon give it back That's to them. Right. But that they don't have any money. The sources of their wealth, I mean, as I said, it's been liquidated. They're, 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 the paths to getting more money from banks is no longer uh, possible. So all they can do is go to black people and say, look, we've got land, you've got your labor power, let's make a deal. And, and the deal that gets made is often um, uh, confused with what comes later. The deal that gets made is what we call share wages. I can't pay you except in a share of the crop. You work, when the crop comes in, I'll sell the crop and I'll give you a share, a quarter, an eighth, whatever the deal is. The later thing that a lot of people talk about is share cropping, which is a very different system. It's just a system basically of renting. Um, and you have to put something in. If you're a black share cropper, you're saying to the owner of the land, look, I've got something to put in. I've got five kids and I can put their labor in. Um, I can find a way to feed myself. My wife can grow some food or whatever. So you're, you're, it's a more of a, um, a relationship where you have more, more, more say so. But in 1865, it's really kind of up in the air. People are trying to make deals and in the midst of trying to make those deals, you get, as Darrell referred to earlier, these um, codes where Mississippi says, well, black people, you can't own any land outside of an incorporated area. Well, what crap? That means that you can't own farmland, right? So we're not gonna let you be farmers, um, even if you want to, but at the same time, you have people who do find ways to grab hold of a few acres. You know, in, in the South Carolina Low Country, you know, my part of the world, I was born and raised in South Carolina, people are fighting to, to hold on to the Sherman lands. They're fighting to hold on to lands that they claimed um, that they bought from the Treasury Department. So it's a very dynamic situation. And in some places, people do buy land. And so in the 20th century, we have a number of black landowners. And when you think about the recent suits against the, um, the 
agricultural department by black, black farmers. farmers. That, that those suits have a history, right, going back to um, the post-war era. So, in terms of working, and or, uh, black people had did not have much choice. Black women, um, for the most part, were were accused of wanting to become like white women and going into the house and not working at all, when in fact they were working in the fields and working in white homes at the same time. But they had decided that if they worked for white women, they would no longer do so in white homes if they could help it. So they would go and say, look, you know, you want me to do your laundry? Give it to me. I'll take it to my house and wash it. Um, I'll come and clean your house from this hour to that hour, but I won't stay overnight. So these are the kinds of um, sort of ordinary Martha, where's Martha? Martha referred earlier this morning to thinking about um, the, the importance of looking at ordinary people and ordinary lives. And when we do that and we get beyond the high politics, which are crucially important to how people will live their lives, but we also have to get down and look at how they actually do live their lives. Terrific, Kate. <laughs> what was the question? Oh my goodness! Well, let's economic. take it all the way back. So, no, uh, I, I was asking about you know, there's a political piece, but then there's also a kind of economic piece and what's happening during this period. And we know we've got the Black Codes, and we have this very powerful d discussion by Tavolia about the agency people are taking to kind of try and make their way. And I guess the, what I was getting at with the question is there are these dual tracks where um, African Americans are interested in uh, obtaining political power, mm -hmm. but also very deeply on a day-to-day -day basis interested in this question of work and labor and the ability to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a key issue in the Reconstruction period as well. At the same time, whites are in the South are seeking to keep blacks from political power, but also very primarily interested in how do we control this labor force for our own ends. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, and I think sometimes when people, I think about teaching this material and, uh, to undergraduates in particular, and, and sometimes people forget about the fact that slavery itself was a labor system, right? And so the entire system that was being upended at this point was founded in how uh, planters, people with land, were going to make money off their land growing certain kinds of staple crops. And um, plantations had particular kinds of forms. Um, they required particular kinds of labor that over the course of the earlier parts of American history, event, you know, ultimately uh, people who owned a lot of land in the South began to increasingly and over time, you know, almost uh, in a majority used enslaved workers to work that land. And so the magnitude of the upheaval when you think about emancipation, I mean, as Stavolia said, I mean, it, first of all, just to imagine the liquidation of that amount of capital that people had tied up, that owners had tied up in their enslaved workers who were also used as capital. They were used as collateral for loans. Mm -hmm. They would be mortgaged. So this was enslaved people. The, 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 the property in persons was a major engine of the Southern economy that kind of upheld a system of credit and debt that made everything work. And so you have the sort of liquidation of this form of property from the perspective of the slave owners, and then you have people who are becoming free who are saying, okay, you know, we need, we want to uh, live, we want to survive, uh, and we need to figure out a way to do that in the midst of uh, this system that has, you know, decades and decades in the making. And I think one of the things that's important also to think about is uh, sometimes people wonder why did uh, freed people stay, tend to stay where they were as opposed to just leaving. And when people are familiar increasingly with the history of the Great Migration and the kind of early 20th century, um, first of all, there is a lot of migration in the post-Civil War South of African Americans moving to different places, trying to find better lives, but also keeping in mind that leaving where you were required resources. Um, you, there were trains, uh, boats in the South. You could, you could go places if you wanted, which was absolutely not true during slavery, um, but you had to have you know, enough money. Or if you wanted to move and become a farmer, let's say you wanted to move to Kansas or Oklahoma, you had to have tools, you had to have a farm animal. And these very kind of everyday forms of personal property were also very hard to come by in the post-emancipation South for free people. And so um, the, the, the kind of economic system that's primarily rural, that is just 
in the kind of wake of slavery is something that we, it's sometimes hard for us to wrap our minds around that, but it is very kind of important to put ourselves back and try to imagine what that would have been like. Well, there's so many stories here that we can't really pull the thread you know, on. I mean, you, even just talking about what that movement is like, there are many, there are many newly freed slaves who, who are moving, and one of the th reasons that they're moving is that they're looking for their family members. So there's a whole story to be told about the effort of newly freed slaves um, and the, and the, <laughs> the effort of, of so many of them to try to reconnect with children who were yeah. sold, with spouses who were sold, with mothers and fathers. And so there is a kind of a, an effort to do that dynamic movement. But as you talk about, it requires resources. It requires n knowing where to go and where you are, right? If you have been raised on this one plantation for your entire life, your sense of the world and uh, geographically is severely limited. And then, of course, the threat of violence. And it would be, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the role of violence in the Reconstruction period, which is so important. Uh, violence as a means of um, uh, ensuring that Reconstruction does not fulfill its promise. Um, and, and you talked about this already, Kate, with, with you know, thinking about the pushback against you know, the, the violence against federal officials. To be a postmaster was to really take your life in your hands as a, as a black person during this period. Um, and I think it's important to just touch briefly on the role of violence. And then I want to pivot to what's already been alluded to, and that's a little bit about what happens in reconstructing the story um, in, the post -recon in the reconstruction and post-reconstruction period of what slavery really was, the whole lost cause idea and the, and the, the monument issue that we've been talking about you know, in, in our contemporary uh, debates that really emanates from what do you do when something, when an event like this happens, when you have a massive, large-scale human rights violation happening in terms of slavery, deeply connected to the economy, deeply connected to a political system, and then it's reversed, how do you account for that in this new nation? And it seems to me this is the project that gets um, distorted. So maybe, um, Eric, we could begin with you just talking a little bit about the violence and the role of violence in Reconstruction, and then we can kind of move on well, to... Well, yeah, I mean, violence was pervasive in, in, in the Reconstruction period, and uh, as Kate pointed out and others, it, it played a very important role in... Uh, in pol it was political violence, in, or what really you should just call it terrorism, mm -hmm. to use a current, you know, understandable uh, term. It was an effort to um, basically overthrow these governments, restore white supremacy in every area of life, not just politics, but economic life, social life, etc. And uh, it posed a giant problem for the federal government and for local uh, officials. Uh, in some places, on some occasions, uh, violence was uh, effectively suppressed. President Grant sent the tr troops into South Carolina in 1871 and, and crushed the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, but as, when it revived again a few years later in the Deep South, uh, the federal government was not willing to continue to, the kind of exhaustion Kate mentioned because of the constant um, sort of uh, counter-revolutionary violence in the South. So yeah, you can't understand uh, what happens in Reconstruction without also talking about the you know, violent reaction against it, which is a sign or an indication of how radical the changes were, that those changes stimulated such a violent, um, a violent reaction. And of course, extra legal violence doesn't end with the end of Reconstruction, okay. lynching, mm -hmm. You know, three or four thousand people were lynched in the South uh, from around 1880 to the 1950s, etc. Um, so, you know, violence remains an important part of the Jim Crow system, which comes into play after Reconstruction is over. Given this reality, given this this um, extreme violence to 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 the, to the point that you have to have actual statutes, you know, the Ku Klux Klan Act, you have to actually speak to the violence, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a matter of legislation. What is the investment of Northerners in adopting a story about what the Confederacy was about that um, that that gives it some kind of nobility? Right, and, and we were talking about this a little bit in the corridor, right? That when we talk about the, the lost cause and we talk about the you know, later period in which monuments were created and so forth, this is not just about Southerners describing the story of who they were in this war in a noble way. This is about Northerners being um, absolute participants and endorsers of this narrative um, about the nobility of, of, of the Confederacy. 
and, and yet you're describing this ongoing violence, right, that, that they're having to fight against. Um, uh, and that you, you, you know, we could, we could maybe say they ultimately become exhausted with, but they're not willing to do what must be done, right, to deal with that kind of terrorist violence. What's their investment in this narrative, this untrue narrative? Mm. Anybody, so, yeah. anybody. Yeah. Can so, you know, I think, first of all, um, and I, uh, so Kate and I kind of know we kind of disagree about this a little bit, when we say northern um, exhaustion, I'm talking about northern exhaustion with black people. I'm not talking about mm. northern exhaustion with southern whites. They're not exhausted with them. Um, so when um, southerners begin um, become even more violent because slavery is violent and a war in itself, northerners push back a little bit, you know, with their um, Force acts, um, Grant sends troops to South Carolina, but not too much. And so this is one of the really interesting kind of uh, historical uh, uh, stories where a nation goes to war against people who are committing treason, right? Mm -hmm. And then it wins that war and it doesn't follow up, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't say, okay, we won, and you people are still acting crazy, so now we need to follow up and convince you that we won. Instead, it says, well, there's some things you were right about. You were right that black people are inferior, right? And so we grant you that. And, and so then, Lee, to get to the other part of your comment, your question, uh, Robert E. Lee becomes not a, um, a heroic Confederate soldier, but a heroic American mm, soldier. Mm, mm. Um, reunion becomes uh, not just a political reunion of North and South, but a kind of reunion that speaks to white supremacy, that, that puts white supremacy on a pedestal. Only this can explain why we're willing to take state and federal monies to um, rebury the Confederate dead, to help build monuments to the Confederate dead, to make Gettysburg not just a northern cemetery but a national cemetery. So there are all kinds of decisions that are made in this moment that, that suggest, at least to me, that the, the pushback on the part of the North you know, it's there in the, in the amendments, the 13th, 14th, it's there in the force bill, but it's not sufficiently there to say that this revolution, this revolt on the part of Southern whites has to be crushed, mm -hmm. and it has to, we have to go back. Mm -hmm. um, we have to go back. Instead, it says, well, <laughs> we'll take out the troops that we have in 1877. So I think it's really important to make that kind of distinction. I think that's really powerful and important. I mean, I think even before, correct me if I'm wrong, but almost immediately after the war when there were southern jurisdictions that said, well, we just can't have black troops, and the decision to say, okay, we'll accommodate that. I mean, the accommodation begins almost immediately. And exactly. I, and, yeah. Kate, did you want to? Um, no, I mean, I don't, and I, I don't disagree with that. I, I guess I, um, one thing, though, I mean, in terms of northern white people really accepting the lost cause idea mm -hmm. that was kind of generated in the South mm -hmm. as a defense of the Confederacy, I think some scholarship has shown that uh, veterans of the United States military from the Civil War held on to the idea that this war had been, you know, sort of their version of this was a good war, we fought a bad enemy, uh, we don't want to see a lot of concessions to, the, you know, their cause was good, our cause was good, we're all brothers now. They, and so part of the dynamic is if you, if, and this is, you know, other historians who have looked at like the uh, Grand Army of the Republic chapters, this Veterans Association of uh, U.S. Civil War veterans, um, is that when they die, when their generation died out too, I mean, and also let's just add that they didn't have, they were one group of people, they, they weren't necessarily in control of what Northerners were doing, what Congress was doing, but certainly when they 
passed from the scene by, let's say, you know, kind of the 1890s and early 20th century, that was a really important moment for, um, among, again, among white people, not among black people, but among white people, a kind of uh, the fading out of whites willing to defend uh, what many people believed the Civil War had become, which was in part a war to abolish slavery and set the nation on a new course toward equality. And I mean, and African Americans, as, as we've talked about, as Lily has said, you know, also continued the memory, as David Blight has written, you know, continued the memory of the Civil War as being that war mm -hmm. um, for emancipation, for a new nation founded on a new footing that remedied some of the problems of the original nation that was forged in slavery, um, that, that never went away. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just that it was uh, abandoned by white Americans for a very long time. And you know that it's powerful because, I'm gonna come to you, Eric, because mm -hmm. of the, when you, when you look at these, I'm always uh, quite moved by looking at these monuments that were created mostly in the first half of the 20th century uh, to a war that happened in the century before to lift up the Confederacy. The, the size, the heaviness, the height, uh, there, there is, there is uh, it, just in the very physicality, an attempt to impose a narrative, right? <laughs> to, to counter the, the narrative of reality that, as you say, never went away and the African Americans are, are, are pushing forth. Um, and so there is a feeling, when I see them, there is a feeling of, of a, a response to, and a very powerful, an attempt to be overwhelming response to another narrative. Eric, what did you want to say about this? Well, I was going to say what uh, you, everyone here knows, that history does matter, mm -hmm. actually, how people think about history. The mythology mm -hmm. of Reconstruction, which I think Professor Guelzo mentioned in the first uh, panel, uh, that it was a period just of corruption, mm -hmm. misgovernment, mm -hmm. that giving the right to vote to blacks was a terrible error, was not just a historical interpretation, but it was part of the intellectual legitimacy, legitimation of the Jim Crow system. In other words, it had very clear lessons. It was a mistake to give black men the right to vote. Therefore, we were right to take away that right to vote. And if you give it back again, you'll have another, all the horrors of Reconstruction again. Um, Reconstruction was imposed on the South by Northerners. They don't understand race relations. It show, the horrors of Reconstruction show you that. Therefore, the white South should resist any outside pressures for change, which began to build up in the 1930s, 1940s, um, et cetera. And even the Supreme Court, of course, this is the problem with Supreme Court jurisprudence uh, on this matter, it's, that it's based on history. It's, a, it's based on precedent. You had bad decision after bad decision, mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. based on a misreading of the, re, of the history. But that's still good law. Mm -hmm. Very few of those cases that we heard about in the first panel have actually been overturned by the, the Supreme Court has never been willing to get up and say, we blew it, folks. Mm -hmm. We actually blew it, when it, and let's start again. You can't start again. Mm -hmm. There's all that weight of history still there. And so what people think about the history of this period actually has very practical consequences, mm -hmm. not just um, you know, as an academic matter. Yeah, and I'd say, you know, for me, that I'll, I'll, I'll just step out of my attempt to be a very neutral moderator at this moment, but, you know, as a, as a civil rights litigator, when you look at uh, some of the cases that we litigate, particularly in the voter su suppression space, um, in which, not, not we, but federal judges are saying that, you know, whole legislatures of states like Texas and North Carolina convened and passed voter suppression laws for the purpose of discriminating against African American voters. That's, that's two decisions by two federal courts mm -hmm. um, in just the last five years. And you compare that to the Supreme Court's decision in the Shelby County case in 2013, in which essentially the Supreme Court is saying is, you know, you are kind of impugning the, the mm -hmm. honor and the nobility of the South, and you're branding them with this terrible history, and, you know, and, and it's unfair to them. Uh, it, it, fe it, it feels, it sounds, uh, in my litigation spirit, very similar to what you're describing, in which, you know, the court also gets invested in a narrative mm -hmm. um, about, about what is happening today, even when that narrative is counter to the facts, counter to what we've been able to prove at trial, counter to what federal judges have found. And so this is dangerous. Yeah. The, the, the adoption of false narratives uh, in this space is really, really dangerous to the, fulfilling the promise of the 14th Amendment, which is full citizenship uh, for African Americans. I'm going to go to questions from the audience. We have some good ones. Um, we, have a, we have multiple questions on, uh, on this subject, which I think everyone wonders. Do you think Reconstruction might have gone better uh, had Lincoln still been president? Not been assassinated. <laughs> Kate, I'll take it down there and we'll bring it back. <laughs> well, I, uh, I think that's a, that's a fantasy that a lot of people have, and I was recently thinking about this a lot because I was writing 
something about the movie Lincoln, Spielberg's Lincoln. And that there really is a fantasy in that movie. If you look closely, it doesn't hit you over the head, but there is a fantasy in that movie that if Lincoln had lived, things would have turned out better. And you have a couple of scenes where uh, Lincoln says to Grant in this movie, you know, don't be too hard on that, the, meaning the, the white South. Um, and you have a th scene with Thaddeus Stevens where he's kind of maniacal, whereas Lincoln is the moderate force. And so I think overall the movie has this fantasy that if the part of the tragedy of Lincoln's assassination was that reconstruction would have gone better, which also sort of implies in this narrative that kind of race relations would have been better, that Lincoln would have solved all of like our collective problems with that. And I think that's, I mean, obviously not the case. Um, I think it's, it, and, and obvious, historians also generally don't like counterfactuals and you know, it's hard to, we can't say what would have happened, but um, J Andrew Johnson was a totally inept president. I mean, he was not only a, a horrible racist, but he was also very bad a as a politician. And he couldn't understand what was going on in Congress. As Eric said, he couldn't understand the kind of northern public opinion. Lincoln was obviously a very skilled politician. Lincoln might, as Eric's book on Lincoln sort of shows, Lincoln c consistently over the course of his political career kind of moved to what we consider the left when pushed by uh, African Americans, when pushed by Republicans who were more progressive than he was. So it's possible, it's likely that Lincoln would have been a much more astute politician than Andrew Johnson, and it's quite possible that he would have worked much more, uh, much better with Congress, although on the other hand, he was already at odds with Congress over Reconstruction policy when he was assassinated. Um, but I think if the, to the extent that the weight of the question is about whether the kind of panoply of problems and conflicts and kind of challenges of dealing with the legacies of slavery in this country could have been avoided if Lincoln had lived longer. I think, you know, th th no, absolutely not. This is a, this is a world that we all um, have to inhabit and cope with and, and kind of imagining Lincoln living for, through, through his second term it would not have solved that problem. Hmm. Aaron? I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, question, should the de facto segregation of the North be part of the conversation? Um, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, absolutely. And I'm going to hold my comment. I'll, anyone on the panel want no, to comment on that? Of course it yeah. should. And one of the problems, and you know, or let us put it this, one of the virtues of the kind of rethinking of reconstruction Kate mentioned a while ago is, yes, you have to bring the North into this, not only as policymakers, but in terms, the North at least acquiesced in the racism in the South, and more than that, it actually was complicitous in it. Uh, we talked about why didn't, you know, African Americans found themselves sort of at the bottom of the poorest region in the country. The South remained desperately poor all through the 19th and well into the, you know, the post-Civil War and well into the 20th century. Blacks are at the bottom of that. Why didn't they just pick up and move? You know, the real economic dynamism was in the North, the modern industrial revolution going on. Why didn't black people just pick up and go to work up there? But the fact is, those employers would not hire black people until they, they would much rather go 5,000 miles away to bring in people from Italy or the Russian Empire or Eastern Europe as the millions came in to work in the factories of Pittsburgh and the stockyards of Chicago, et cetera, then go 500 miles to the south and bring up blacks. How do we know that? Well, it's obvious because 1914, World War I breaks out in Europe. It cuts off immigration. Then the Great Migration begins. Then jobs open up in the north at the bottom of the industrial ladder, but still much better than you can do. And then you get a massive migration of African Americans uh, from the South to the North. But for many, many years, they're kind of trapped. They can't get out of the South, mm -hmm. except in fairly small numbers, until jobs open up uh, mm -hmm. in the North. But by then, they're moving into, you know, fundamentally segregated mm -hmm. communities in, in Chicago, Pittsburgh, Detroit, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, so that's all part of this story of why you pick up any newspaper today and you'll discover the vast disparities that still exist in social, you know, statistics, economic statistics between black and white Americans. And it's all rooted, it's not just rooted in slavery, it's rooted in the continuation of racial inequality long after slavery was gone. And if you really want to learn more about this, then I want to commend to you um, a book that was published last year. It was shortlisted, longlisted for the National Book Award 
uh, and it's um, uh, uh, Richard Rothstein's The Color of Law. Right. And it is about the role of the federal government in segregating the American North uh, in the 20th century. Very, very important to, to marry to this period. I don't know if anyone else wants yeah. to comment on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, did you want no. to say, okay. So Eric Foner said that reconstruction worked in some ways. In what ways did it work in the former Confederacy? Well, I, it, it, I mean, this, no, all right, you go ahead. No, you I, said it, so you I can. Don't, <laughs> you know, we always talk about reconstruction as a failure, which is, I think, not actually the best way to look actually, at it. Actually, we I'm, don't. Who talks about it that way? Well, like on exam questions, <laughs> midterm <laughs> exams, yeah, why did Reconstruction well, the reason, fail? The reason I'm interrupting you is because there is a narrative about Reconstruction that I can tell you is in the, in the African American community that is actually very proud. Good, that, that good, really, it that should focuses be. focuses on all of the African American elected officials, yeah. how many African American men were registered to vote in that period. I, we think that actually many Americans don't know that African Americans were you know, elected of as secretaries course. of state, lieutenant governors, there's but no in monuments southern states. To that. Because there's no monuments, there's exactly. Like there are to the Confederate <laughs> exactly. generals. So, no, no, that is, it didn't last. Yes. In other words, that, yes. that is a moment it to failed. be very right. proud of. Okay. It failed to mm -hmm. become a permanent feature mm -hmm. of the society. But you know, many accomplished, apart from that, you know, the, the black church as it mm -hmm. exists today mm -hmm. really comes out of Reconstruction. It had existed beforehand, but as a massive institution in the black community, black families, as you said, mm -hmm. were reconstituted who had been separated uh, under slavery. Black uh, schooling, black public schools, uh, higher education comes out of Reconstruction. And these are the springboards for the future struggle. So it's not like everything was wiped away despite the reaction that, mm -hmm. that came later. And so, yeah, and even the very fact that these governments existed, that they try, started rebuilding the South, they set up the first public school mm -hmm. systems in the South, uh, they passed the first civil right, we heard about the need for state level civil rights, as mm -hmm. Martha said before, that comes out of Reconstruction, mm -hmm. the first state civil rights legislation. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in U.S. history. So, yeah, there are many accomplishments. There are many failures, like in any historical mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. Let me use this question, to because we haven't used the words Freedmen's Bureau, and we've been supposed to be talking about Reconstruction, so we have to. Um, <laughs> and so um, I wonder if uh, Savolia, you or Kate, could talk about what you think is maybe the most, you know, one or two of the most positive things to come out of the Reconstruction period, some of which, you know, still, still last to this day. Well, I mean, the Freedmen's Bureau, um, certainly important on the ground, mm -hmm. um, important um, for helping people to find their families, um, important for helping to negotiate contracts, even though most of the subassistant commissioners uh, uh, were more inclined to say to people, look, don't expect to get rich, <laughs> don't expect to eat more food, um, you know, your rations will probably be the same, you know, you're free now and one day all that stuff will come, but still it's important. But also, you know, the point I also want to make here about the Bureau is that the history of the Bureau has been uh, given to us as a kind of uh, a, a burden on the American tax period. You know, so this Federal Bureau set up and has a commissioner, Oliver Howard, for whom Howard University is named. It has the state uh, sub-commissioners and then the sub-assistant -sub commissioners. And they're all on the ground working to help black people make the transition from slavery to freedom. And so one thing I want to say about that is that the money for the Freedmen's Bureau um, in part comes from the labor of black people during the Civil War. That what we don't talk about is that um, when people became free and the government sent them to work on plantations, they were paid a wage and they were taxed. And the taxes went into something called the Freedmen's Fund. The Freedmen's Fund funded the Bureau in part and it funded several black colleges. So that's a part of the story about Reconstruction that we don't tell that is um, if told in that way, it would be seen as a, an accomplishment mm -hmm. on the part of black people that we actually, or they actually, uh, played a role in funding this organization that helped so many. Um, and there are lots of bad stories one could tell about the Bureau as well. <laughs> what do you think was the 
one of the accomplishments of, of Reconstruction that you think was long lasting? Well, I think I'll, I'll say what seems kind of obvious in this context, which is the three constitutional amendments, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, which uh, were complicated, which were not immediately realized, um, but which really had the potential to transform the structure of American government and the ways that we understand individual rights and equality. And, um, you know, the, um, the earlier panel, you know, did a great job of, of sort of talking about that, but I think, and you, you said this in your introduction, I mean, I want to really, it's really important, and I, and I hope maybe the two panels together can do this, is to contextualize the 14th Amendment in the history of Reconstruction so that, um, you know, it's often, we can think about it, especially if we're thinking about constitutional law or in the abstract, as just another tool or another, you know, amendment, another thing that you can sort of work through legally, but that this is a product of this era, along with the 13th and the 15th Amendments, and when you think about how they really transformed federalism, uh, or let's say they, they had the potential to, uh, really transform federalism, and I like to m make sure to underscore um, the enforcement clauses mm -hmm. of each of those amendments, that you know, the fifth section of the 14th Amendment is Congress has the power to enforce this mm -hmm. amendment, and the 13th Amendment has a similar one, and so does the 15th, and that is part of what signals the transformation that before the Civil War, even if Congress, which it never did, had wanted to end slavery in the states where it already existed or enforce the rights of African Americans or anybody else in the states, uh, it would not have had, most people thought, the constitutional power to intervene in the states in that way. And so these amendments really transformed the role of the federal government and they really made it possible to have an idea of um, individual rights that could be enforced or kind of backstopped by the federal government if, a, if the person in the local area was not having um, their rights respected. So it really kind of redef had the potential to redefine um, you know, just about everything um, that, mm -hmm. that kind of goes on in this country. So Kate has ended precisely where I wanted to end, <laughs> as though planned, um, because I, I do think this is important. We knew that this panel could not take in everything. There are so many more things to talk about. We have talked about uh, you know the, the failure of, 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 of women's suffrage and including black women you know in, in on the very terms of the of the 14th amendment we haven't talked about the the effort of, of uh, uh, emancipated blacks to try and get a, a, a pension you know to just try and get money so that they could bury uh, their dead and to try and get money so that they could uh, give old age pensions to slaves who were physically broken in many ways and who um, you know, could not work anymore. There are many stories to tell during this period, and so I really encourage people to delve into, deeply into, what happened during this important period in American democracy. But Kate ended where I wanted to end, which is to say, as a civil rights litigator, that our conception of what the federal government has the power and indeed the obligation to do in the face of challenges to the terms of equal protection of laws and due process of laws comes out of those enforcement clauses of the 14th Amendment and this innovation is how I think of it, this powerful uh, innovation in the 14th Amendment is one of the most important things to come out of uh, the Reconstruction period. And that is to imagine a role in which the federal government has an obligation to protect the citizens against the state. And we should really be clear about that because I think sometimes people pretend that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are not what they are. It's powerful for an amendment to the Constitution to say no state shall or that the state cannot, right? It, it is directed at the states, directed at the states, and provides for the federal government to have the enforcement power when the state does not comply. And as you look and you read about different challenges, civil rights challenges that you're seeing, uh, play out in our contemporary landscape, I invite you all to remember that, that by the explicit terms of these amendments, it was expected that the federal government would play a role in protecting the rights of citizens against infringements by the state. And this innovation is the center of our second founding, which happens after the Civil War and happens during this reconstructive construct, construction period with the passage of the Civil War amendments. And I just could not be more thrilled to have had this conversation with this terrific panel. And please thank them with me for this discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Have a great.